welcome back listeners one and all to HTO Football. As ever, your two co-hosts this evening are Andrew and myself, Tom. We are though joined by two others today. We've got James Dowden helping us fire some questions at our guest. James joining us as a student from Bristol, getting a bit of experience on the pod. We are though delighted to be welcomed by our second guest, who's in for his second appearance on the pod. That's right, we're talking about sports film creator, showrunner and editor extraordinaire, Mr Richard Cook. Before we hear from both our guests, Andrew, how are you? Are you well? Are you looking forward to this episode? It's another good one, isn't it? Amidst our HTO film series. Yeah, yeah. As the as the darkness descends outside, uh, the, uh, the the climax to our HTO film series, Sport on Film, and a uh, lovely way to end with an old friend of the pod. So, um, yeah, looking forward to this one, Tom. Fantastic. Um, James, are you well? Welcome to yeah, I'm doing really well, thank you. Um, uh, looking forward to this evening, and uh, thank you for having me on. Not at all, not at all. So, Richard, how are you? Are you well? Are you busy? Yes, very busy. We're making another series at the moment. I'm in Italy this time, so a bit a uh, bit different from the northeast of England. Um, and we are, are we, oh gosh, how far are we through? We're about 18 months into the project and we should have it delivered by the end of the year. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a long old project, this one, but, but something we're really excited about. How long have you been over there? What's it been like with everything um, over in Italy? It's uh, how long have you got? Where do I start? I mean, we. I mean, I I joined the project in November, tw- uh, twenty nineteen, and then we were all set to get underway. Um, you know, we 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 had to leave Italy. I think. Um, or we actually we, we we were back in London, but we were due to come back to Italy literally sort of a couple of days before um, lockdown started. Really, so uh, fortunately, um, the broadcaster, which is another streaming platform, uh, stuck with us. So we we kind of trundled on over the course of the summer, and then started filming again. Or well, we started filming for for real at the end of August. So we are we are following a, a full uh, Serie A season over here. Right. Okay. So that's that's Richard right now. Currently, if we can swing it back all the way to the beginning, Richard, this is a question we like to ask a lot of our producer guests. Um, where did it start for you in terms of film creation, that type of thing? Was it was it that and then sport afterwards, or was it the other way around? Yeah. Interestingly, I I, I mean I love sport, but I never ever thought I would make sports documentaries or, or programs about sport because there was never really the budget or the scope. Um, the, the BBC were really the only channel that were, were making anything in terms of sports documentaries and, and even their output is quite small and their budgets are quite small. Um, so it's only really the, with the advent of the, the streaming platforms, um, Netflix, Amazon, and to a lesser extent, Apple, although I think they will probably start to get into this territory. Disney, possibly. Um, I wouldn't mm-hmm. rule anything out because their remit's very broad. Um, that they have the you know the kind of budgets. I mean, the, the budget for something like this because it's it's one of the world's biggest teams. I can't tell you who, unfortunately, in the moment. Um, you know, the the budgets are um, they're like you know sort of feature feature type type budgets. So they're um, uh, you know very well um, funded. For me, it, it started. I actually wanted to be John Simpson when I was sort of sixteen years old. I wanted to be a, a journalist. I wanted to be a, a foreign correspondent. I wanted to go to places that you couldn't go, however much money you had, you know, um, whether that was war zones or it, TV offers you the, the opportunity to go to some extraordinary places. But actually through through doing quite a lot of work experience on local newspapers and local radio, it didn't seem to me quite as exciting as I had imagined it. You, you, in journalism, there is a, there is a very sort of long, um, career path so you have to be incredibly dedicated um, and at the time I was I was I had work experience at Pebble Mill in Birmingham um, which is the old BBC building and they were making shows like Top Gear um, and, and a, a load of other sort of um, the clothes show and I was kind of wowed by by that side you didn't have to wear a suit for a start you know you could you could wear whatever you liked the, the hours were a bit more flexible and so, um, I, I mean, I just, I, I sort of just started working on all, all kinds of programs and, um, and you need to get that grounding because t- TV is such a broad industry 
you need to sort of understand whether you want to work in in drama in documentaries in current affairs in factual entertainment cookery shows um and because it's so broad you know your your interest often will kind of guide you into the area that you want to go but as i said with me and sport there weren't really the opportunities to work in in this kind of area until uh, streaming platforms came about mm, it's definitely definitely an industry now though where opportunities are plenty um, it's a booming, booming industry at the moment, isn't it? And I think that what's what I really wanted to ask you, which is that as as time's gone on, as the industry has flourished over the years and decades, do you feel like the quality of the content has improved, or do you think it's just because the opportunities to actually grab these stories and broadcast them are there? I mean, I think it's inevitable that the, that the quality improves. We're, you know, we we are always striving to. Uh, you know, to make better shows. So, so in this in this instance, you know, they they the channel, the the, the organisation in this case, the club will look at previous documentaries. They'll look at Man City. They'll look at Tottenham, and they'll say, "Well, we want this to be better. We want you to keep raising raising the bar." So, and I think we we learn uh, more and more as we go. I mean, personally, I don't like to watch too many of the other shows because I think you can get. Um, a little bit drawn into what 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 they've done mm-hmm. um, and in terms of originality you always want to try and try and keep that fresh mm. we had bet with ben and gabe turn off on a couple of weeks back on the f- previous episode to this and uh, they were talking about the they feel that the kind of episodic format is just really hot at the moment you know people are like that kind of netflix style you can over a story drawn out over a long period of time yeah. instead of maybe something like a feature film um, is that something you're in agreement with Oh, completely, because you can really explore characters, um, you know, to, to follow the story of, of a football season in two hours is a, is, a, is, a very, is a very difficult challenge. And you, I think what happens is you, you, you sort of naturally end up following the story of the season. Yes, the story of the season is your, your overlying narrative arc, but there's so much more that goes um, goes into it so you know you're looking at the the manager of the team the key players you know when when we look to make this type of documentary we don't want to just make it about the team this is about the organization so actually in a way it could it's it could be a business documentary if you like because it, it's a it's a business it just happens that the the the, the subject matter is is football so we look at we have a t- we have a shoot team um, with the players and the manager and the coaching staff we have a separate team with the administrative side, but then we also have another team with the fans, with uh, a journalist and either podcasts or, or radio shows. So it sort of gives you a full kind of 360 of, of, of the club. Mm. I have to say it's been very interesting trying to follow the administrative side and the fans this time around because it's we're in such strange times. Mm. And um, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to go to a game yet, without anybody in, in the stadium. It is the strangest experience. I mean, the first, I mean, uh, so that the home game here and then an away game in, um, you know, a huge city here. And, you know, it's sort of 80,000 seater stadium and you can hear people's phones going off and, uh, and, and everything that the, the players say and everything that's coming from the touch side. It's, it, it's, it's, it's sad really. It's, uh, you know, we can't wait for fans to get back into the stadium. Yeah. And, uh, there's almost a documentary almost about f- to be made for <clears throat> being a fan during the last couple of years, isn't there as well? You know, the story of a football fan in 2020. Um, we, well, it, yes, but it's hard because you can't really get into people's houses anymore because of the, the various protocols. And, and you're filming with people with masks on all the time. You know, I mean, Tottenham had it because, because the coronavirus hit at the end of their series. Um, Full Well made another show um, with a women's football team, and their season just ended. So, mm. but very, you know, the, the challenges are 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 huge for us in terms of, you know, if we look back to say Sunderland, the, you know, the the the, the beauty of it was, I mean, so much about the fans. If you go back and watch watch those episodes, the fans are are so central to it, the passion, the the noise that they create, the the emotions, and you realise what you're missing when you don't have that. And so it's a it's a massive hole for us to fill, and I I don't think we've quite solved that problem yet. Absolutely, I, I wanted to ask you one, and that's sort of a really prime example of, of something unexpected. One thing that came up in our discussion last um, last couple of weeks ago was also the the difference as a as a creator of 
films or it'd be interesting to get your perspectives of, about something that's still a living breathing documentary i.e something ongoing like a season um like in, in progress um versus a retrospective look so you know at something that's happened and it's finished and and do you, the challenges that brings um do you try, have to try and detach yourself from a, a, a finished product because obviously you, you don't really know where the season's going to go when you're following a football club versus a story that's been told andrew and i've been really lucky this um film series on hto we've we've had a couple of um film documentaries to look at stories told so we had the turners on to look at sort of class of 92 you had catch soha on to look at um sort of the two tribes liverpool everton in the 80s and liverpool as a city and two clubs as a thriving but a city struggling versus a couple of really live beasts you know something you know like uh, we had you know we looked at the notorious uh, conor mcgregor journey over the last four or five years and, and you know gavin there was just saying we had no clue where conor's cross story was going to go and it wasn't going to launch into the superstardom and similarly we have no clue where a football season's going to go at the beginning of it um and what does what does that look like and feel like and the differences between the two be really interesting i i guess my my role is to is to, is to make a certain number of hypotheses yes it's I think you you look at how a season uh, could potentially go, but I mean ultimately you, you're only making a, a guess, and that that in a way is is the beauty of making documentaries, but it's also the, the terrifying aspect of it, you know, because um, if a team loses, um, then that's actually very good drama, as we prove the Sunderland. But if a team's winning all the time, then that's pretty boring, and and that's actually a way of getting a lot of rival fans uh alienated from from the show so i think what you, what you have to do is is look at or think about what's going to happen off the pitch because you can control that a bit more you can't control what's going on the pitch so look look around and for me it's about um it's about the characters so you know in our case the manager in particular is is of huge interest to us um and we have the, there are a number of senior players who are icons um, you know, some of the best players ever to play the game. So uh, we actually, starting, starting the point, um, one or two of the players had a good natural art, whether that was they were starting the season with injury and we followed their, their rehab through to the reintegration into the team. Um, others, you couldn't be quite sure what their arc is. But you, you eventually work it out and, and you find a way and it, and it becomes apparent. So um, a- actually, the, I don't like to say the word formula, but the, there, is a, there is a way of making these shows. I think we, we've done them for a little while now. So I think we're, we're a bit wiser to what can possibly happen. Mm. Of course, there's always, there's always something that happens that you've never encountered before. <laughs> that's, mm. that, that's just TV. You think however long you've, you've been working in the industry, you've seen everything. Um, there's always something new, but, but it means that we're always learning and we're always, we're always growing. And I think uh, it's a, it's a wonderful, I, I try to engender a, uh, you know, an atmosphere of, of collaboration and, and, and creativity so that we're all, we're all working together and, you know, the, the team will, um, will expand and contract and change and people's roles will change over the course of the project because, you know, we, we are there for, you know, for, for sort of nine months of the season. So it's a long old time in TV and TV land. What, what's, your, what's your dream gig? Um, Gabe was banging on about, I'd love to do the Tiger, uh, Tiger Woods documentary. Um, you know, what, what's your dream gig? Is way, if, you know, what, would, what show would you love to create and put together? Well, Apart from apart from doing one of these at Aston Villa, yeah, I was going to say this this season. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I mean, one that people would want to watch, Richard. Obviously, (laughs) do you do you really want to start jostling with me now? Look, I mean, everyone would want to watch an Arsenal one right now because it's just so much turmoil up (laughs) and down. Arsenal Arsenal till I die. (laughs) You can't have Villa. You can't have Villa. They're winning every week. You you know, like you said, that would be boring. They're just the success would be too much for everyone. You have Arsenal TV, which I, I follow on social media. I mean, I, lo- I, I just adore Arsenal TV. I think it's one of the greatest, the greatest things. <laughs> um, we don't, most Arsenal fans, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's a huge embarrassment to you, but I think for those of us who, are, who don't support Arsenal, it's, 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 it's very, very funny. Um, so, I mean, the, actually, my, my dream documentary at the moment, uh, I want to, uh, I want to make a, uh, a feature film with Paul Smith, the designer, uh, about um, uh, about 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 design, but also I think about aesthetics. 
that that for me would be would be particularly interesting because he's not just interested in design. I know it's not sport and it's probably not the answer you were <laughs> you no, were hoping no, for, for and expecting. But yeah, nice one. Um, that that for me would be a dream because he's a he's an icon and I think that, that the time's right to do something uh, amazing with with such a visionary as, as he is. Is that is that one of the that's obviously one of your 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 passions, uh, Richard? That seeps through the the Sunderland till I die documentary. I feel as well. It's is there are there certain Gabe and Ben were, were almost saying you, you, as a as a film producer slash documentary maker, you don't want your creation to look like a Richard piece, if that makes sense. It should just speak for itself. Do you, do you think that, or is there or are there, are there certain things that you just want to impose on? You want to impose on something yourself. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, Ben, Ben and Gabe are interesting because they, they have a more of a film background than I do, I think, and so they probably buy. I mean, I, I wouldn't say um, that I have a, a look or, or a style necessarily. I think, um, I think you just take each project on its merits, and your starting point is very rarely what your end point is, anyway. And, and actually, with a project of this size, there can be quite a number of people who who get involved um along the way so it, it, it's a it's a process really but it's uh i mean it's a it's an exciting one for sure you mentioned at the beginning about your sort of journalistic interests growing up um, mm. you were familiar with uh, icarus the expose film yeah yeah is that are you is that something that you really enjoy sort of watching as well just as a fan with with, with your kind of journalistic passion as well Yes, I mean, well, I mean, th th those films often don't start quite the way that they end, um, and, and and that I think is the beauty of any type of filmmaking is is the unpredictability of, of it all, and you don't know, you know, there are films that can be made over 10, 15, 20 years in duration, and and they're re real passion projects for people, um, and so yeah, yeah, I I I I think I think that's very true is you know there, there can be all sorts of opportunities i guess and um but to, to be able to make something that you're passionate about and that you love i mean that's that's the dream right <laughs> mm, mm, mm. yeah so we've got james james is gonna crack on with his uh yeah putting, about putting... Jour journalist angles journalist angles i think james is gonna fire some questions at you um james joining us as a student at bristol G good evening richard how are you yeah i'm very well thanks how are you yeah yeah not too bad um, you mentioned earlier uh, kind of the length of process that a documentary series such as Sunderland Till I Die takes. Um, can you take us through that process from start to finish? And is that time period that it takes always set or does it vary depending on the club or the season that you might be following, for example? Yeah, well, I think I think once the once the chat, I won't sort of take you through the, the commissioning process because that's something that I don't tend to get involved with. And that that can be a sort of long and quite drawn out process but generally once the channel gives the green light um at that point then you'll you'll put a team together um the, the budgets will be fixed um we'll we'll have a sort of plan of which which cameras what, what kind of equipment we're going to use um to, you know decide whether we're going to all move to location um, and how that's how that's going to work then really the the first part of the process is is to get embedded within the club and to become like them to become effectively like one of the team that that's that's really important and it does you know it takes time to gain trust um you know you're asking about the duration yes if we're going to do the the, the you know the story of the season so let's let's say in normal times the season begins in august so you'd ideally want to be at the club by the back end of july your film through to, to the end of the season. And then it takes a further, it can be anything between sort of three to five or six months to finish off the editing process. But the editing process with something like this, because you generate so much material, so many rushes, um, you generally start to have the editing process. I mean, we started the editing in this in November. So the edit will sort of run alongside. Because if you think about, we've got three shoot teams um, shooting on a daily basis. We've got a fixed rig inside the dressing room. There's a big thing for, for this series. We have got access, access to the dressing room, um, which was a, a, a prerequisite for this, um, which we so didn't have in Sunderland. Um, so we've got the, the multiple fixed rig cameras in the dressing room. We've got fixed rig cameras in the training ground. Although unlike Tottenham, we're much less reliant on, on, on the fixed rigs. Um, 
so you can see you can start to see that on a daily and a weekly basis we're generating a huge amount of, of material so once we start to become embedded uh, with the players we can start to get um, a better level of access with them start to understand what makes them tick uh, understand their relationships with each other who the you know the relationships are and start to follow their story and um, and, and and that will that will obviously run on until um, until the end of the season, and then we'll we'll finish off the the editing process. So that that's that's as as succinctly as I can put how we would put a production together. So obviously a very long process encompassing many kind of technical hours of filming, and then for you, how do you put it down into a, a more concise and viewer experience shall we say um during the editing process well i think the important thing is to try to keep it simple uh you you, you know you have multiple characters and you can't tell everybody's story so you you know it, it's imperative that viewers watch the show and like the people who are on it you know there are so many programs around that you know people can give give you 30 you know 30 seconds 20 you know 15 minutes and they could switch off and, and find something else to watch. So we have to grab people right from the start. We have to uh, show likable characters. We have to sh show story arcs uh, coming out right from the start. And, and as I said, if we try, if we can keep it as simple as possible, um, yeah, because I always think that, you know, you need to be able to appeal to people who don't necessarily watch football and people who are watching this in in countries where football isn't you know isn't one of their big sports I, and that's the other thing i think to, to bear in mind when you make a show for a streaming platform you know unlike say uh you know a network uh channel in in the uk you know you're, you're making it not just for a much larger audience but you're also making it for for a much more diverse audience so those are probably the key things to bear in mind and then were there any challenges that you didn't anticipate when filming with professional teams and players? Every day there's something new. It's, it's very, very difficult because, um, you know, you, well, you are outsiders and it's a, it is a very sort of small world within, uh, within the football community. And, um, you know, you have to remember that, that footballers have, have grown up in, in dressing rooms and um you know we're we're interlopers really in in their space i mean i think you think you have to think about it in terms of you know in your daily life would you fancy having a tv crew follow you around <laughs> you know it's not it's not everybody is comfortable with that and you have to respect that but you, you have to find a way to make um make everybody comfortable and and engage within the series as much as you possibly can so I mean, there are there are there are all sorts of challenges. I think that the, the biggest challenge for us is that when when a team loses, they they take it really badly, and it's it they can sometimes you know shut down. And and again, it's it's natural that they probably don't. The last thing they want to do is talk to a documentary crew saying, "Oh, well, how do you feel about you know losing that match?" So you know, but it's important that you you get the ups and the downs you know that's what that's what sport is all about i mean we as fans you know we hate it when our team loses and we feel bad for you know can can be days on end and you know footballers feel it you know just as bad if if not worse so yeah navigating the the ups and the downs is is incredibly difficult and then you mentioned uh, your current project in Italy, um, but flipping that on its head, perhaps, uh, would there be any um, past seasons or clubs or teams um, from a more historic avenue uh, that you would have liked to have shot a documentary for? It's uh, a good question. Uh, I, I presume I can't use Aston Villa as an example, can I? Um, if, you, if you so wish. And we can. Yeah, you can. Uh, can I'd like to be a bit more original than that, I think. I mean, uh, I'm, not up, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily sucking up here, but I think the Invincible season would have been pretty incredible. The, uh, uh, the Preston North End one. The Preston North End, <laughs> North End that's it. from what was that, 18 something? 1892. 18, um, 
I mean, I mean, you know, any time when I think uh, a relegation is unexpected. I mean, the the lead season when they dropped out of the Premier League, uh, you know, under Ridsdale, when you know they'd been they'd got to the the semi final of the of the Champions League. Cause I, there are, I think there are just moments when everything fall, completely falls apart, or possibly the season when Brian Clough's last season in charge at Forest. That might be interesting. Leicester as well. Yeah. Well, Larry. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Leicester, Leicester and, and Ranieri. I, I think you're always looking for something that sort of feels extraordinary. But, but also, um, well, I think what That's I'd also right. say is that, you know, we have to maintain originality because, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there, are, there's, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of these type of documentaries around now. And I think, I think channels need to be increasingly discerning about their choices um, and not, not just necessarily think, oh, well, this is the biggest team in Spain or this is the biggest team in Germany or, you know, whatever. And I think try to think about what the, what the story might be and what, what it's actually giving, giving you is because if we have too many uh, documentaries that don't really engage with people, then, then people will, will start to switch off. Uh, but, I mean, but TV has a cycle anyway, you know, the, the, there are, there are trends with TV. It happens that at the moment, this type of documentary is, is very popular there are the budgets to be able to make these kind of shows, but you know, I'm not sure how long it will it will last. <laughs> Was there anything that you learned from working on the Sunland uh, documentary series that you've taken into your current work in terms of challenges and your approach to working with the football club? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think you're, you're you're learning all the time. I think that the biggest the biggest thing that I took from from Sunland was the structure of the team to be able to, you know, you, you've got, you've got constant challenges. So if, if, you know, in this case, you know, the, the team's playing Coppa Italia matches, they've got the Champions League next week, you know, they could be playing two, three games in a week. Um, you, you know, you, you, you need a huge amount of resources to be able to cover everything. You've got to roast to people so that, uh, you know, you, you're you're able to cover the matches, but you're also able to cover the training sessions, the stuff behind the scenes. You know, players who were injured. You know, I'm very interested in things like, um, you know, player recovery and nutrition and all 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 these sort of elements that make an elite club sort of mm. stand out amongst the rest. You know, looking at those sort of fine details and going, you know, okay, that's really interesting. I never I never knew that. You know, because so I think we the machine watched, of the club. Yeah. Yeah, well, we we watch so much football that we we probably think that we're we're very knowledgeable about about the game and about how things run. But actually, I think when you're inside the football club, you realise it. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. So there, there are still. I mean, it's a it's a also it's a constant battle because you know the big clubs have got huge social media outputs now, and they're generating a huge amount of material. So we have to be very careful that what part of the pie is left, what part of the, the pie that you know nobody else has seen before uh, we, we can we can maintain that so so it's it's difficult but I mean I, I think the other thing is that you just have to be become part of of the club just be nice to people be be friendly be respectful I think un- understand the the way that the, the club works and how it operates because however hard you try you're not you're not going to change their processes <laughs> You've alluded it. Uh, you've alluded to it earlier, but do you feel that club-focused documentaries are likely to become more prevalent uh, going forward? And do you think that clubs in the future will start producing them themselves, or do you think they will tend to remain in an external production bubble? I think. I think there's probably. I think probably both. I know Fleetwood made their own series with Joey Barton, but I'm not sure. Quite I, I don't know. That, I can imagine. But, you, you might be able to tell me, but, um, you know, because they've got amazing access and they've got all of the dressing room stuff, but is Fleetwood a team that you can sell? I, so I'm not sure whether they ever managed to sell it. Leeds was effectively made in-house because, you know, the, the chairman got his production company to do it and then sold it onto Amazon. But um, it's very difficult to make shows that way because you just don't have the budget. You need the backing of a streamer from the start because you just need a, a you know a large amount of resources and i think i think the i think the genre will continue to grow because there is a there is a thirst for it i mean who wouldn't want to watch their team or or a, a big global team um, across across the season and finally from 
Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was, yeah, I was just going to jump in on that point and say actually that how it evolves will be really interesting for me because I think the, the viewer will demand ever, ever closer to their club, the act, all access that um, yourself, Richard, and, and, and the lucky few to create these fantastic shows get these days. We'll just want more and more of it. And I think, you know, Arsene Wenger once said that one day fans will be able to pick the fourth substitution on the social media or something ridiculous like mm-hmm. that. But you do wonder whether soon players will wear tiny little cameras or microphones and games so to be, to be able to hear it and see it from their viewpoints to, to, to feel, put that through. Because I think you'll become so much more about the return on experience that you get from following your club. Um, than, than ever before and I think that'll be really interesting to see how the sort of the genre and it evolves. Again. Well it, it, interestingly I did I did try or I did look at investigating having referees wearing a little camera because I know they do that in rugby because yeah. we you know or at least to try and get the audio of what was going on you know during the match um, again because I mean we're fortunate on this series that the coach is is mic'd up during the games but you know you, you need that you need to know what people are saying you need to you know get a sense of what of what's going on so i mean i wouldn't rule anything out i mean the, the technology now is yeah. is developing at such a pace uh, it'd be really interesting to see where it goes and then finally from me um do you think that football lends itself especially well um to this type of documentary series or do you think that other sports as well um can lend themselves to it any sport I mean, this is really what it comes down to is storytelling at the end of the day. We're storytellers. And, um, and, and that's, that, that's the, the skill or the failure of us, you know, being able to, to create a story. Um, you were asking actually about which show I'd, I'd like to make. I, I know that they are now making a, a documentary with the Toronto Maple Leafs in Canada. And I always thought if you want sheer passion. Oh, nice. I, hockey, I was going to say ice hockey, you can't say that, can you, to a Canadian? Hockey in Canada would be amazing. Mm. But unfortunately, they've chosen a Canadian company yeah, to make a documentary about Canadian hockey team, which uh, to me seems strange. Why wouldn't they choose an English company to do that, like mm. us? <laughs> great one. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great, great one. Gretzky, something like that would be Well, amazing. because, yeah. you know, if you think about passions, you know, I, I was always very interested in people who um, were interested in, in, in kind of minority sports, like... Uh, um, tractor racing or lawnmower racing. I always thought, why would people do that? What well, there must be some really fascinating characters who mm. give up give up their all of their spare time to go and do something in front of one man and his dog, or spend all their money. And their you know their partners must be completely fed up with their obsession. <laughs> all mm. of that sort of fascinates me. So, but all it comes down to really is human nature and storytelling. At the end of the day. Well, I think you're right because you know, look at look at the biggest show on Netflix in the last two years now, um, the Queen's Gambit. And I, and I know it's not a documentary; it's obviously a drama. But but nonetheless, like that's chess. And the reality is, if you yeah. walk up to the average person in the street and say, "Do you like chess? Do you love chess?" You know, not many are going to say, "I love chess." Like they might say, "I don't mind a game of chess," but do, they do love chess. And yet, that's gripped so many millions and millions of people, and it's been a fantastic show because, like you said, it's storytelling. And actually, sport and let's loosely use the word sport, their games or anything like that, people people they do grip people um and actually you know there's there's so many facets to that to be you know being a short only performer whether that be on a chessboard or on a football pitch or wherever it may be all the stories behind it um in drama form or documentary form they grip people so we are coming we are coming to the the end of our of our film series story on hto and uh, just we're not finished just yet though um because this is the problem when you invite another guest back for a second cap is that you can't catch them out with the counter attack anymore. Um, yeah. But we are going to do we are going to do a second round of it, Richard. So Tom's going to kick us off with some quick fire questions for you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, favorite director doesn't have to be sports. Doesn't have to be. Ken Burns. First sports documentary that you loved. Uh, probably the QPR one. Favourite non-sports film? So just your favourite movie to sit down and watch. You asked me this before. Has it got to be a documentary? No, it was the favourite film. Favourite, like, you know, favourite blockbuster, favourite movie. It could oh, be favorite movie. Singing in the Rain, well, it could be. Well, no, no I mean, we should... Um, I, people ask me, you know, what's your favourite music? What's your favourite film? And I, ne- I never have an answer. It's, um, it's hard, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think about it. if I come back to that one at the end and see if I can remember the name of the, the documentary because it is it is brilliant if you've never seen it. Yeah, so we've got this the sports story that you just love to be told that hasn't been yet. Sports story that I'd love to be told. Um tough 
one, to be fair. It is a tough one, isn't it? I'm very good at multiple choice most of the times. Uh, I don't know. Come back. I'll come back to that one. Let me have a think. <laughs> Someone in the industry that you'd love to work with? Um, Tom McDonald at the BBC. Okay. He's one of the, the main commissioning editors there. Mm. So before we before we finish up with the final one, Richard, have you got a, have you got an answer for the uh, the earlier one yet? Uh, what my favourite film? Yeah. Did you mean Boyhood? No, no. Uh, so that was I, filmed I, over many I, years. I, I remember it? it now. So, so my favourite documentary is called Searching for Sugar Man. Oh, okay. L- look it up. It, it is. It, I mean, it is one of those stories that you think, is this actually real? It, it, you know, and and it's so brilliantly done. It is. Um, is amazing and there's we've got a nice one to finish off with the film series richard leading a crew sports documentary sports film whatever what is the number one value for you leading a group of people on a film on a film set uh i can only have one and i'd say communication communication is is key make sure that you are very clear with your with your vision and your message because when you have a large, I mean, especially now, we, we're in a situation where there are people 10 meters from me who are on different Zoom calls because we're all kind of, you know, we're all having to sort of keep reasonably isolated. So, and things change very, very quickly. So it's, it's imperative that you uh, communicate well. I mean, I would also say just, just be nice because it's, it's a very nice, it's a very hard job and you need to be able to enjoy it at the end of the day. And so, um, that, that goes a long way. You haven't had any Tom Cruise blow ups yet, then? <laughs> no, but I got his point. I, I got yeah. his point. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. there's been one. There has been one or two moments. Not not quite as as bad as Tom, but um, there's been one or two moments where uh, <clears throat> yeah, you need to give people a kick up the backsides because again, it's a, it's a long period of time and people can can get a little comfortable. But that, again, that's that's it's natural. Mm-hmm. Well, again, Richard, obviously, absolute pleasure. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. As um, ever, absolutely. All the best with the piece of work that you're on. All the very, be- all the, yeah, all the very best with the finishing, yeah, finishing your current, your current program. It sounds a fantastic one. Obviously, we're really excited to hear more about it. And when it, when it's out and released upon the world, obviously, you have to come again, make, take the lead. No one's got a third cap yet on HTO, so you have to come and take the lead and tell, tell um, all the listeners about your, your you get, show. You get, but, uh, you yeah, get a HTO, something. you get a HTO football for a third appearance. Or something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but, well, yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. I'll let you know when the trailer's out. Yeah, beautiful. Hot man. Okay, thanks. Have a nice evening. Yeah, Take care. Tom, I really appreciate guys. it. Another fantastic chat there. Um, what a way to wrap up the series. Richard's always uh, really fascinating to have on. He always goes into the technical detail, but I love that because, uh, you know, he doesn't really we get to get in the weeds sometimes. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah, you can tell he really likes the storytelling element. I love that um, because films, that's what a film is, I suppose, in, a, in, a, in its simplest form, you know, and... Um, yeah, it's been and, and just a really enjoyable series. And thanks, obviously, for James for jumping on some cracking questions again. Just because if it's for students out there, we are going to continue to make sure um, lots of student opportunities are on the podcast, uh, making sure you can come on, interview guests, sort of do write ups sort of with articles beyond the sort of the panels and the masterclasses we're going to do. So, yeah, really keen that we make sure we're creating lots of opportunities for sports media professionals as we interview sports media professionals. That's what we're, we're keen to do. And we did, though, throw out another um, extra time. Uh, tweet and question for for listeners viewers and social media people what was the question Andrew so we were asking what is the best football England football song of all time Um, and we had a simple 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 polling system uh, three lines uh, and world in motion I mean you could put another in the comments but I mean it's got to be out of those two surely and Tom what, what was the result Result was quite quite emphatically not not ridiculous. It wasn't like a nine nil thrashing of of late. Um, sorry, Southampton fans, um, but it was quite comprehensive. In that three lions was beating World in Motion, and you know, look for me and and probably for you as well, Andrew. Like in our childhood, three lions was huge. It was that we were that perfect age, Euro ninety six. You know, completely fooled the country. But World in Motion is also a banger. It's such a great song. So you got two fantastic songs there. Were there a couple of other suggestions? Were funny. What what other ones have stuck out in in mind's eye years gone by? Yeah, I think others have been very gimmicky, haven't they? You've had 
songs like Vindaloo and, you know, On the Ball and all that kind. Whereas those two were actually just great songs, weren't they? Yeah, to be fair, I loved On the Ball when it came and when it when that Van and Depp and that dropped. Um, we've got Move, 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 Red yeah. Tribe. Um, the match nice. of the day theme tune. Someone put someone put in the match of the day theme tune. <laughs> you can't you can't move from that really as a football. It's an iconic um, song. Um, but no, Free Lines was the selection um, from listeners, and you can't really go far wrong. So on the next pod, there'll be another extra time debate. So make sure you get your votes in and listen yeah. to HTO. Follow us on all the socials as ever. HTO Football, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, the works. Lots of work, but we love doing it. So keep listening and stay tuned.